Why is it that we, I shouldn't say we, maybe I should just put I in there. I know this truth. I know that, that there is a day of reckoning. And I, it's true for all of us sitting here, old and young, from the oldest to the youngest. This is certain. This will not change. This is going to happen. And this is one of those promises that bring both blessing and comfort and joy to the Christian 
or condemnation if we're living with a load of guilt. You know, there's this, this joy that life is unfair. We're judged wrongly. We're faced with things that aren't the way they should be. But if I stay rooted and anchored and grounded in Jesus, there is a fair judgment. It won't, it, it's not up to my fellow man. It's up to God. And so if I live for him, I can live with the blessing that he will do it and he will do it right. And we will end up in the right place. That's a promise that brings joy. On the other hand, if I'm fudging, if I'm angry with my fellow man, if I think I can somehow steal and get away with it or live immorally, God says, no, the day is coming when you will stand before me and it will be fair. And we can think, you know, I, I don't have to make a full commitment. I can be half-hearted. On and on and on. But this is one of those promises that we didn't read this morning, but we didn't have time for 7,000 or 8,000. I don't know how many there were. But this brings a settled rest to me, and I, I'm sure it does to you too, that from the oldest to the youngest, the word, when the word all is used, it doesn't exclude anyone. What a promise. What a blessing. When we live for him, we will be treated fairly. It won't matter where we come from. It doesn't matter what our past was like. It only matters that we are living for him now. And this brings rest to me. I hope this, this uh, helps us as we go throughout the message. You know, it, there, there is a bit of a sober, sobering aspect to all of this. It keeps me awake. It keeps me going. Because I know that how I either stop or go all matters in the end. So may we think about that as we think about the message that, that what we do with, how we handle what, what is brought to us really, really does matter. And God bless you as you. Christian greetings and welcome to each one. Glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Been a real refreshment last during the night when I woke up and heard it rain. I just needed to praise the Lord. It was such a blessing. It's relaxing, first of all, and secondly, we needed the rain. And it was just endearing to me, to the Lord and Master, for meeting our need in that way that during the night. As I was preparing for a message there are so many different things that went through my mind and sometimes it's hard to settle on what the Lord is trying to say and uh, this week a couple days ago there was an article by Peter uh, pastor Bob Culp in uh, the paper and he writes about spiritual things and he had uh, a comparison there that uh, I read and it was interesting the sim uh, this is the title of it similarities abound between gardening and sharing God's work those things that was involved in um, meditation and preparation and then the last several weeks we've done something that I learned from a very small boy uh, that is taking care of weeds. You know, the weeds just seem to pop up like everything. Judy and I probably killed hundreds of thousands of weed seeds or weed plants this week and last week. And so as I was thinking of that, I thought about what about spiritual weeding? And how are we taking care of the weeds in our lives? Are we continuously on them or do we? You know, one thing Grandpa always said when we were little boys and we kind of dreaded being out. He had such a large garden for two people, yet they always had some to share with us, which we're thankful for. And not only that, there we were taught uh, we needed to weed the beans 30 acres of them 
that we had to go through approximately three times a year. And uh, that was our summer job, <laughs> not going camping. We, we camped out in the bean field, I guess you might say. And uh, we even got our youth talked into helping us sometimes. And that was a real blessing. It went real fast then. But, you know, as I thought of spiritual weeding, a verse came to my mind that I found in Acts 26, verse 20, in the last part. And there it says that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Uh, a spiritual weed taking care of them. Repent. Uh, prepare, like we heard Brother Laverne say. The one road leads to heaven, the other road to destruction. Now as we think of natural weeding, I, my mind went back to Genesis, and I'd like to turn to Genesis and read a few verses. Uh, Genesis uh, 3, reading verses 17 through 19. There it said, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all thy days, all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy brow, in the sweat of thy face, shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground. For out of it Wast thou taken, for to dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Amen. That's as far as I've chosen to read in that portion of Scripture. But we notice that because of disobedience, God said the ground is cursed, or that there's going to be hardship involved in, in uh, the production of those things that we need to maintain life thorns and thistles all was perfect at creation before there was a sin or before there's disobedience but because of sin and disobedience that changed and it's going to be that way until the end of this physical earth the ground would still produce he said but according to the greatness of sin in a person's life it's not going to yield its fullness it's going to take work it's going to take effort uh, Psalms 107 verses 33 and 34 there's a promise there you want to call it a promise it's a it's a warning really uh, there he says he turneth rivers into a wilderness and the water springs into dry ground a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. So according to our sin problem, according to how we look at God, according to how we maintain with God, the curse is going to be more abrupt. It's going to come upon us more greatly. That's often wondered. Did the Sahara Desert at one time flourish? I don't know. But we do know that it's not flourishing today. We also get the sense that Israel was a land of milk and honey. Lots of grass, it gives indication. I wonder, you know, today it's not that way. They tell us how that really, what David really meant was maybe some of their own ideas of how that could mean because it's not that way but we have scripture that says if they forsake me I'll make it a barrenness God takes away the blessing likewise for us as we think of uh, thorns and thistles what are we going to do about them tells us there gives us the idea the sweat of thy face indicates that work is required to eat the herbs or the fruit thereof. We need to labor. We need to take care of that. Grandpa said, and I didn't go on with that, 
Grandpa said, take care of them weeds while they're small. Just little bitty ones. So much easier than when they get to be this tall or like the button weeds out in Wendell Field where it takes all your efforts to pull them things and you get bad itchy fingers and slimy fingers and so forth. Uh, it's difficult then. Take care of them when they're young. Nip them in the bud, we sometimes give the, the statement. Do it while it's the easiest. But it still takes work. It takes dedication. As I think of that, I think of what weeds do. Weeds rob the moisture. It takes away from the fruit that you planted. It takes away the moisture that they need. It robs them. Secondly, they seemingly grow faster. I don't know why, but seemingly weeds grow faster. Well, I, in a spiritual sense, in the spiritual weeds, I understand more clearly because Satan's behind pushing them. He, he just keeps on. He wants that to flourish in your life, not the good things. He wants the bad things to flourish. Satan is our enemy. He, he tells us in the scriptures that the enemy comes and plants the seeds and gives indication that it's done in the night. During the night it happened. You know, it's not out there in the obvious. He's, he's working deceit, uh, deceitfully and, and pushing his uh, plan. And as the weeds grow taller, then it overshadows. And any, any plant, many fruits that are planted, if they're in the shadow, they don't grow as good. They need the sunlight. But the weeds get the sunlight. And so they grow faster because they're bigger. We need to take care of them. Weeds seem, another thing that I've seen over and over, weeds seem to flourish even when it's dry. You know... You go out there and you you want to doctor your garden and get things to go and them weeds and it's dry so you start irrigating or putting pouring water on them so that they'll grow but the weeds they keep growing they it seems like they only need a fourth of the water that the plants do maybe it's satan doing some of that in our spiritual lives he wants to push us it takes work to keep the weeds down Another thing weeds do is they produce seeds that will grow later. Uh, Satan does his work so that it will continue. He, he wants to make sure that his deeds will go on. Uh, one of the things I think of is uh, some of those seeds. I, I just remember our neighbor uh, that uh, didn't care about his pastor very much and and he left those thistles grow out there for several years. And, and it bothered me. I didn't like it. Of course, I knew too much maybe about thistles and their seeds. And uh, sure enough, one summer I took out two five-gallon buckets full of thistles that I dug out of my yard. Hmm those seeds blew over there and they were growing years later they were coming up thankfully we have a neighbor that does better he keeps those weeds mowed and I don't have near the trouble anymore I dig out once in a while uh, a thistle and but not very many but you know that's one of the things that you can do for your neighbors if you don't like them is plant some thistle seeds and let the seeds go around but it doesn't make peace doesn't make peace at all. Be, do those things that uh, uh, are helpful in our relationships. Also, harvest is affected if we allow, if we don't avail ourselves to taking care of the weeds. Uh, we can let the weeds grow in the field, but when the crop is harvested, you may be docked or that's the word they use you get a lower price they they lower it because of all the seeds that are in with the good corn or with the good beans and so that is also affected and secondly it's hard on machinery um, 
some of those uh, big weeds, I don't know, we always used to call them button weeds or velvet leaf or whatever it is. They have stems that get to be about that big. And, and it's been known that it will even knock out the sickle blades on your machinery when they mature and you let them go. And secondly, some of the green things that are growing when you're harvesting and you just left it go can make a mush as it goes through the harvester and, and, and just cause a lot of problems in harvesting. It's so much nicer when the weeds are taken care of and there's none there. Sorrow is mentioned in that verse. Weeds are disappointing and disgusting, the natural weeds. It's also the same way in spiritual things. That's, I believe, the way God looks at it. You know, take care of those things. He's given his life that we might all be redeemed. But not everyone does. And I wondered already, what's the face of Jesus like when someone rejects him? Does he have tears? I don't know. But I do know that it's probably disappointing. I gave my life, and they're rejecting it. <clears throat> we know what happened to the children of Israel. For hundreds of years, they were asked to follow after the law and to do the things that lead, led up to Christ's coming. But they forsook. They took, like we heard this morning, won a victory and then he brought the idols back how do you think God felt you know those are the things that brought the destruction of Jerusalem they were warned and they were warned and yet they didn't heed and so finally God destroyed took care of the temple the city and they were taken captive for 70 years before they could return again what are weeds? Webster says, an undesired, uncultivated plant. It's useless. In agriculture class, we had another thought that was given. Even a good plant, not at the right place, is a weed. Good example of that is a corn in a bean field. A corn plant in a bean field. Here and there, they're a weed, even though a corn is a profitable uh, plant. It yields forth a, a, a corn ear, uh, but in the wrong place, it's a weed. <clears throat> Just recently, there was a flower in the midst of a driveway. Hmm. Who? We all like flowers, don't we? But in the midst of a driveway, it's a weed. It got plucked out. I took care of that thing. It's not in the right place, so it was a weed. <clears throat> How does a person remove weeds? I like to look at that. And this is all in relation to uh, the natural weeding, but we can apply it to the spiritual weeding also. In the days before tillers, I remember that because we used to do that. When the ground is hard to hoe, we used to hoe them, but sometimes the ground gets very hard, especially in my hometown at home. It, it, it was hard. You couldn't even chip it out. So what did we do? Grandpa told us, scrape. Get rid of them weeds. So we scraped them. And we got rid of the weeds. They couldn't continue to grow there because they, they didn't have any leaves to take into sunshine. But you know something? The roots were still down there. And that root remained there till the first rain, and then poof, it flourished again, and there they were. We had to go out and do it again. But it was the easier way. It wasn't a time when you could use a tiller. But you know, there's so many that do that uh, with their own lives spiritually. <clears throat> In a spiritual weeding, many people use this method, self-discipline themselves, 
change things on the outside, make pledges, are sorry they failed, but they don't make restitution. Like Judas. He was sorry that he had betrayed the master. He thought he'd make some extra money and could probably put it in his own pocket. He didn't give any indication of that, but anyhow, it was not wise what he did. And he repented, it says. He went back and wanted to give the money back so that they changed their mind and not do it. But they refused. And so he threw it down. He was sorry he got caught. And it burned in his pocket. It was price of blood. He didn't want that. And so he just threw it there to him. But he didn't make restitution like Peter did when Jesus reminded him that he had failed. What was the end there of? You know, that's what happens. Uh, it wasn't a good result. He lost his life, but he took it. It wasn't God's desire that that would happen that way. <clears throat> I believe Judas had a conscience that bothered him, but he didn't have the love of Jesus down in his heart. And that caused him to take his own or make his own decision on how to end this situation. And it only made the situation worse. <clears throat> In Matthew 23, verse 25, Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees, You make clean the outside of the cup and platter, but within you are full of extortion and excess. You know, there was something lacking there. The top was scraped off, but the root was still there. And it didn't bring forth good fruit. Another way of taking care of the weed is to pull the weed. Sweat, labor, sore hands. It's a very positive kill. You pull that weed out by the root, it will not revive. It's going to be dead. It's going to be over with, that one weed. That's the way Grandpa told us to do it especially the thistles. We had to dig them out. Um, and that's another thought. Sometimes uh, you may need to spade the place to get the root to come out. But when the root comes along, it cannot continue to grow again. And that's the way God wants us to take care of the sin problem. He wants us to get to the root all the way down. Give me all of your sin. Not just a part of it, but repent of everything. Fall post, uh, postured at, my, uh, at the foot of the cross and let it there. Tell him to take it. For spiritual weeds getting to the root, recognize it is a reed. That's one thing that's very necessary. Recognize that it's a weed. <clears throat> this week while I was coming home from work one day I went past the cornfield and they had a low spot there during the summer and, and as I drove past I looked out and I thought well, what did they plant here? Beans or corn? Because there were green stuff down there well it looked like beans but they weren't beans, they were weeds it was growing and flourishing you know, sometimes we don't, we think we know what to do, but we need to take care of the weeds. Um, pull them. Recognize that it's a weed. Recognize that what I'm doing is wrong. That's what happened when John the Baptist was out preaching to the people. They're Jordan. And there was what? There was repenting, and there was confessing, and there were people were being baptized because they felt a need. There were weeds in their lives, spiritual weeds, and they wanted to take care of it. We need to recognize it as that, or we'll never take care of it. It will not be. <clears throat> a testimony against my father that... Uh, I wish I could have been able to help him. And I think in the future, uh, after many years, I was able to help him to see 
but really a doctor helped him to see it more. He had a tobacco issue, and I used to tell him that that's not good, it's harmful to the body, but Dad didn't realize, he didn't see it as something bad. He didn't see it as something good. He said, maybe it's wrong for you, but I don't see it that way, so it's not a weed. But, you know, it hurt my heart when later on in life, he was having breathing problems. He's in the hospital, and so he, the doctor come in, and he took that pack of cigarettes out of his pocket. He threw it in the waste back and said, don't ever touch them again. It's killing you. And he accepted it. It became a weed at that moment, and he didn't touch it after that. We need to recognize that there is a weed, that it is a weed, that it's harming us. It's ruining our destination, our, our harvest. It's, uh, it's something that ruins the harvest. Then secondly, ask the Lord for his help. Believe that he will. Rebuke the devil. He's the one who's pushing you to do these things. The Bible tells us to flee from the temptation. Flee, youthful us. Don't give in because they will ruin the harvest. <clears throat> Temptations, stay away. Don't get close. Fill your mind with good things. Meditate on the word of God. I know in Romania there was a man that had a drinking problem. And he got victorious over it. His testimony was that he goes far around those places of drink. He stays away from it. He don't, he's afraid that smell will come back in and re-tempt him and he will fail. Stay away from it. Don't get close. Fill your mind with good things. Meditate on the word of God. alcohol and drugs don't start don't take the first drink maybe the first drink don't do anything but it gets you started stay away good advice for anyone <clears throat> Matthew 12 34 in relation to uh, recognizing the weed says for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh or does Again, going back to the thought of the root that's down there. We've got to get rid of that root. And then repent, as John the Baptist said. Both Jesus and John taught that. Be truly sorry for a sin. Stop doing it with the Lord's help. You can't many times do it on your own. But be desperate. Ask God to help you. Turn it over to Jesus so he can heal it for you. Seek help. You're unable to conquer it. Seek help. Go into a relationship with someone that tests you. Says, where are you at? Are you staying true? Are you staying free? Those are things that help us. Other people. Sometimes we just can't do it on our own. And we need others to help perk us on and move us on. Seek help. Don't do it on your own. It, it won't happen many times. <clears throat> Another way to take care of the weeds in our in our day, we can spray for weeds. It used to not be that way, but we could do that now. And and it does its good job many times. But we must use the right spray. We can't just grab any spray and take care of it. It don't work. Not all weeds or not all sprays will kill all flowers. I have a little demonstration here. I want to show you. There's a little weed here. Looks pretty green, don't he? Yeah. Well, that guy got just as much Roundup as all those weeds out around it. But it's still flourishing. Roundup, don't kill it. But all the others, it did. So, what do I do with those? I could probably go get some spray that would do it. But it's easier 
when I see it, I just pull him out by the roots, and he's not going to grow again. He's going to be dead. <clears throat> we need to read the labels. We need to do that which will kill the product that you want taken care of. You need to be careful because sometimes you kill the good things too. This morning I was walking, meditating, and along the north side of our property I planted some trees. And uh, I have some evergreens there, and, and I notice, oh, this one is brown in the top. How come is that? Oh, then I notice the grass is brown around it, too. It got a little weed spray. And it didn't really need that. But it was a mistake. I'm not blaming anyone. But that's what happens. Sometimes the good gets destroyed with the bad. We need to be careful and be wise. We need to read the label. And as we think of spiritual weeds in that way, here we have some labels. We have, we have the knowledge that we can get on what takes care of what. You know, sometimes some of the weeds that are growing that need to be killed or taken care of or to cut down, um, some need prayer. Prayer of the saints. And uh, some of them need special prayer. More focusing on some things. You know, according to what the deed of the weed is. Some need rebuking in the name of Jesus. Something that's more precise, especially I think of uh, of some of the uh, uh, ongoing things that idol worship can do. We need to that are more complex weeds to take care of them. We must apply the Holy Spirit to spiritual weeds. The Holy Spirit is the power to overcome sin since the day of Pentecost. He's here to help us, and he will help us if we call upon him. Acts 1, 8 says, But ye shall receive power from the Holy Ghost. When the, pardon, let me say that again. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and to uttermost parts of the world. It's the answer to uh, the spiritual weeds that we can bring to destroy them and have a successful harvest, a, a victorious harvest. I'd like to turn to Romans 16 and read a few verses there now. As we think of what does this power accomplish? The power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Chapter 16 of Romans, beginning to read in verse 25 and 26. <clears throat> now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret from the world when the world began, since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known unto all nations for the obedience of faith. We notice that the power to accomplish is establish a person according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That will be an answer. That will take care of those spiritual weeds when we let God come into our heart and life and we take care of the root and we allow that to cleanse us and make us a new man. And we also become, it says there, we become convinced of the accuracy of the prophecies in the Old Testament that God is true, that it will happen, it will come. There are many skeptics today that say, is the Lord going to return again? He hasn't done that yet. Jesus said, I will return. As you have seen me go, I will come again. If we believe that, we will live it. 
and we will believe the accuracy of the promises and of the prophecies. And then, last of all, there in that verse it says, the obedience of faith. Being obedient. Philippians 2.12 says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, and not as in my presence only, but now how much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The German uses the word in that space, Galassenheit, which means obedience because of love. Because of the love that we have for what Christ did, we follow willingly. It's obedience, not a must, but it's a willingness that we want to perform and do the things of God and to live according to his will. <clears throat> Power over the plague of sin. That which ruins a successful harvest. It's the only way is when we allow the Holy Spirit to help us overcome those weeds. And we not only just scrape them off, but we dig them out or we completely kill them. Many times what happens with weed sprays is they will kill the upper part above the ground, but it travels down and also kills the root. And it needs to do that. And that's what will keep it from growing again. Now I'd like to, in the last couple of minutes, I'd like to look. I have a number of them here, and we won't have time. Let's look at a few of the more common spiritual weeds that must be eliminated or pulled up by the root to have a successful harvest. One of the first ones I thought of is pride. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. We know if we read about Satan's beginnings or um, how he came to be the Satan, pride went before him. Uh, that's what destroyed him. Satan was cast out of heaven because he wanted to be like God. He wanted to lift himself up. Will it be any different for us if we lift ourselves up and we, we want to be like God? We let pride be ruling in our heart. Will we be destroyed? Will we be cast out of heaven or not allowed to be in heaven just as Satan was? He's also deceived because he thinks he can still win. Deception. Proverbs 6, 17, we notice that the six things that God hates, the first one named was pride. Let's be careful of that weed. It's a very big, strong, it's so easily we can be found having that in our lives. Self-will nature. The big I. Me first concept. I want it my way. <clears throat> I picked out the example of King Ahab in 1 Kings 21. He wanted a vineyard that was beside his palace, but the owner wouldn't sell it to him. And, the re and he had a reason for it, because it was inherited, and he didn't want that inheritance to be mocked. So he didn't sell it to him. But, you know, King Ahab, he wanted that thing. And he was determined to have, and his wife helped him in it. They too co-conspired, and they ended up coming up with something that would be an offense to the owner, and they ended up stoning the owner and stealing the property. But what was the harvest? The harvest ended up Evil and destruction came upon him and his family forever. It disappeared. <clears throat> Jealousy is another one that we need to be careful of. It happens so quickly. Genesis 2, 7, where we notice Cain and Abel. Cain was jealous over Abel. He let his countenance down, as the Bible says, or his respect and love. The Lord did not accept his offering. And as we look, and I think of that, the Lord had given Cain an extra opportunity to repent. Because when he came to Cain about the situation, he says, why is thy countenance falling? 
fallen or why don't you love and respect your brother uh, he had reasons he was saying but the Lord said if thou doest well shalt thou not be accepted if you take care of the weeds won't it be acceptable to me and he goes on and he says if thou doest not well sin lieth at the door there's a problem there the weed is there and of course Cain did not take the warning but he ended up killing Abel and bringing more sorrow into his life more evil come his way anger Proverbs 29 22 says an angry man stirs up strife and a furious man aboundeth in transgressions the Amplified says causes and commits transgressions <clears throat> Proverbs 15 1 a soft answer turneth away wrath but grievous words stir up anger soft answer Pray that God would help me have a greater desire and more and practice more soft answers so that anger would not be stirred up. It's a weed. We need to have it hoed out by the grace of God and his help. The Holy Spirit will help us in that. When we have the love of God saturated in the depth of our beings, there are no rumblings of anger that will erupt. Thinking of a volcano. Uh, just a thought that I was impressed with. Another thought I came across, anger is a hostile feeling because of opposition or hurt. Self-pity type of hurt. <clears throat> Antidote for anger we find in Colossians 3.15 the first part where it says and let the peace of God rule in your hearts that's a root that can flourish and bring forth good things be a fruit unto righteousness I'm going to skip down to one more and I think it's very vital unforgiveness unforgiveness hinders spiritual victory in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, 12, it says, and we pray many times, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. Do we do that? <clears throat> we find it hard sometimes to forgive those who sinned against us or done something against us. We think we have a right to hold them at arm's length. But the Lord says, forgive our debtors. And if we truly forgive our debtors, we can be forgiven too. If not, we won't be. Is that serious to you? It is to me. And I need to ask the Lord's help to do that. I know I had to do that for my father, and I... No, I was victorious in it. I could face him with a clear conscience. I'd had no grudges. And yet, he treated us the way he did many times. He also taught us many good things. But I was able to forgive him by the Lord's help. And that was a key to my victory. <clears throat> Those who have done evil or have done us wrong, we must sincerely forgive them. Or we cannot experience total victory it's a must in the kingdom of God I think of Joseph and his brothers when they sold him to slavery down in Egypt and he was gone told their father that he a wild animal had killed him evidently because look at the blood on the coat uh, but then eventually they came face to face what did Joseph do? Forgave them. He even allowed them to live right there next to him. And he brought the whole family down. That's how come they ended up in Egypt. Because the forgiving spirit that Joseph had toward those who had wronged him. In closing, 
I'd like to give a quote from George R. Bronk Sr., a very predominant uh, evangelist in the generation just before me. There he made a statement that I appreciate. He says, no matter how cultured a person may be, no matter how carefully he may imitate Christian conduct, unless he has been picked up from the sin road by the good Samaritan, he can have neither life nor health. The end of quote. Sin has to be removed by the master, and then there can be victory. Shall we stand for prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we know that spiritual weeds we need to continuously battle. Satan is out to destroy us, and he wants us to just scrape off the top if that if we need to do something. We just go a partial way. We don't get to the root so he can flourish again and destroy us. Father, we pray for grace to humbly submit to you and what you have done for us, the plan that you have given to us for redemption, that of surrendering completely, coming before you at the foot of the cross and saying, I'm done. You take over. Give us what it takes, Lord, and we can be victorious by, because of what the Holy Spirit has done for us and will do for us. And we also appreciate the brethren that help us, that show us maybe where we can't see, where we're being overshadowed and think we're doing okay, but they can see the difference and can remind us that we can take care of those weeds. Help us, Lord. There's so many weeds, that spiritual weeds that we need to take care of, and it can be done by the grace of God. You want us to be victorious, and we can be victorious if we turn our life over to you. Give us grace to do that. Your love overshadows us, and you want us to do that. You gave your life that we might be redeemed, and we praise you for that. We want to be in the glorious place of heaven, the fruitful harvest that can benefit us both now and in eternity. And we also know there are scriptures that says that the weeds need to be taken out and separated and they will burn with unquenchable fire. So those weeds that continue to grow and need to be taken care of the last day, there's destruction. There's no hope. Father, give us the grace to say yes to you. Be near us and keep us. Bless us. Bless your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Give opportunity for someone to say something, testify, or...
creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Filled with wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing, Praise to the King of Kings, you are my everything, and I will adore you. Our hands are lifted high, our hearts are bowing in reverence. We're surrounded by 